Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here this afternoon for this uh, roundtable, for this panel, to talk about uh, the audience for virtual reality works. As you may have seen during the previous roundtables this morning, the question of creativity in the virtual reality seems to be self-obvious. We need it. However, the question of uh, who's going to actually be the viewers. For those of you who are experienced in the field of uh, creation and the, and the content of creation, meaning that if you don't have viewers down the line, if you don't have uh, an audience, you won't have a business model to speak of. And even though you know there are people who are willing to take risks in terms of producing the work, if in the end there are no viewers, it is very likely, unfortunately, that we may have to drop this altogether. So to talk about audiences, we have with us several uh, profiles, I would say, this afternoon. They cover, I guess, uh, the whole a uh, specter of uh, stakeholders, if you will, uh, distributors, Sushil Fasine from Arte, Tom Burton from the BBC. So, cinema-like uh, players. So, Camille Lopato from Diversion, a new outlet dedicated to virtual reality. And Agnès Alfandari, so she represents the institutional partners, so the uh, Institut Français, tasked with the promotion of French movies abroad. So, let's take a a look at this from the uh, point of view of distributors and broadcasters. So how do you think you'll be able to best reach the uh, putative audience? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. So as a broadcaster, I I'm used to broadcasting, so I'll try to show you quite a lot of pictures, and uh, I'm not going to dwell at length uh, orally, I guess, on this, but uh, if you have questions, obviously, at the end, don't hesitate. For those of you who may not know Arte, we are a French-German channel dedicated to culture and creation. I would say initially we were, because over the last few years we've evolved, and now we are more of a global European media rather than just purely French and German, and this was accomplished through the use of digital media and we uh, not just you know virtual reality obviously for more than 10 years now we've been offering uh, catch-up programs it was actually one of we were actually one of the first channels to do that online in France and uh, we also produce uh, shows and programs that are specifically uh, created for the uh, online outlet, you know, web documentaries or fiction now, also interactive or not, video games also, because we believe video games are also a great way to convey an author's point of view, a cultural message of sorts. So we, we want this, this creativity, which is mostly French for now, but also European, to, to have a, again, to have an outlet. So we are a global European media because thanks to our presence online, Line and our digital projects, we can reach a larger audience than merely the French or German ones. And we can go beyond catch up TV as well. We came quite naturally, therefore, to virtual reality. It became a new, new playground for us uh, via, you know, interactive documentary, interactive fiction, video games. Virtual, virtual reality appeared as the obvious next step for us to try new forms of uh, storytelling, new forms of production as well, you know, TV producers, um, video games companies digital companies as well, so again, it came to us quite naturally, and we also believe that the form of immersion that is afforded by virtual reality gives us the opportunity to tell stories in a different manner and also maybe to reach out to a new, a different kind of audience. It also gives us the opportunity to uh, 
discover new talents, new authors. Also, virtual reality is an emerging market. So it is important. We believe that French and European uh, players um, get a chance to well, to thrive too, because uh, well, we don't know whether this technology will be mature one day and can tell the future, but when it is mature and if it is mature, we will need to have the experience. And since we've been at it for four or five years, it's been a, a you know a trial and error process, but we've learned quite a lot, I think. So, um, again, it, it allows you to be a global media, the, the digital aspect of what we do allows us to, have, to be a global media. I uh, encourage you to go see a co-production that we made with Agathe Finn uh, uh, called uh, Notes on Blindness. It's a French British production. There's a, uh, another project called Audio Gaming also, which uh, is a program of virtual reality. So as, as a medium for us, it is very interesting because it is sort of the achievement of a global offer. So the global offer is, first of all, a documentary, which we broadcast on TV. It's a one-hour documentary. And there is a second part to it, or uh, another work altogether, but which is connected to the first one and is interactive and in virtual reality. So let's take a look at the uh, teaser of Notes on Blindness. This is cassette one, track one, Notes on Blindness, and this is the 21st of June, 1983. Sitting in the park with the children, I hear the footsteps of people walking past me on the footpath. Further out to the right and behind me there's the car park and the sound of people starting and stopping their cars and driving off. Way off to the left there's the main road and the noise of the heavy traffic roaring past in the distance. The strange thing about it is that it's a world which consists only of activity. In the blind person's appreciation of weather, wind takes the place of sun. If only there could be something equivalent to rain falling inside. of a room would take on shape and dimension. So, I imagine that this uh, made the audience want to actually experience it. Where can we find this? You can find it as a native app on uh, iOS, Android, on Gear as well. So this program actually required the uh, creation of a specific app. There's quite a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, new, you know, interactivity. 
This is not systematically what we do, because usually what we try to do is uh, put all of our you know, programs on uh, our app called uh, Arte 360 VR. So that's one of the very first TV app to provide that. You can find um, a very small part, actually one chapter of the global app that is available on our general app called 360 VR. But uh, as a, yes, as a rule, we try to gather all of our programs, uh, all of our shows on the app, we are, are, are 360. This is a sort of a you recreate a channel. Yes, we'll be on the channel. We recreate a universe, if you will, a space. It's a bit too loud. So basically, we want to uh, be able to offer you know, a lot of VR experience, documentaries, fiction as well, and many other things. This is also something that we can find on the Samsung store and uh, as to the uh, broadcasting or distribution strategy, well, since it's an interactive program and it requires obviously, interaction with the audience, we have to develop a specific app, as I said. So obviously we want to be you know, sold on uh, a large you know, number of stores, Samsung, Apple, but as you know, it carries a cost to be present because it needs to be adapted basically to the uh, various uh, terminals. So we've, uh, we are on the Oculus store of the Samsung store, so it's a VR store for mobile phones, So, but it takes a lot of time, it's very time consuming. What's interesting with virtual reality is it's a bit of the same thing as with video games when you want to adapt uh, one game for a different console. Well, we have an agreement with Oculus, so I cannot give you any figures. The question was about figures, but uh, it's actually one of the most downloaded VR program uh, last year, if not the most downloaded last year. So. But, you know, we've, uh, we have an agreement not to disclose these figures for now, but uh, beyond the mere figure, I think what's interesting is understanding the reason why the stores want to promote it. I mean, you know, the, the movie uh, won quite a lot of, uh, of awards and prizes, and it goes to show that there can be a kind of storytelling that is specific to virtual reality, and it shows that this technology is not just, you know, a marketing tool or a marketing stunt to promote, you know, a Hollywood blockbuster. It can be a, a work of art of its own if you, you know, put enough thinking into it. So, but at the beginning, this project actually was not a VR project, it was an audio documentary project. But what with the, uh, the arrival, if you will, of VR, our team thought, you know, why not give it a go as a VR project? So, and beyond the success of this program, Notes on Blindness, it shows also the, the type of strategy that we can have as a broadcaster, Ma namely that um, there are forms of writing and storytelling that are specific to the format. It's not just uh, copy-paste, if you will, of what we do for TV. Much like you know, when you're on social media, your message has to be conveyed in a manner that is specific and adapted to uh, social media. So I think we think the same goes for virtual reality. You really have to uh, to think it through to create a group program. If I may move on directly to uh, uh, alteration. Uh, yes, I was going to cut you off. You are. <laughs> yes. Um, so alteration is a fiction. It's not easy to approach fictions. 
um, in virtual reality, basically to know how to write specifically for, for such a, a tool, if you will. What can virtual reality bring to fiction? I think the uh, Okio team, with I it's not working anymore? Can you hear me? Better? One, two, yes. Can you hear me? Now I'm going to count to three and you'll dive back in. One, two, three. Is it over? What are you talking about? The girl Elsa, the experiment. Calm down. Calm down. Charlie! Charlie, what's wrong? There's a woman. Not enough. <laughs> so there's a version of that movie that you can uh, see in the uh, exhibition hall there. Before I turn to Tom, so that he may tell us about uh, his work at the BBC and the BBC strategy in this in this field. So I'll first put the question to you regarding the business model. We'll ask for most of our models. We co-produce projects up to 3 or 40 percent of financing. And as for any other audiovisual or digital project, produ producers uh, receive uh, funding from the CNC and other forms of public or private financing. Oculus put some money uh, into the production of that project because obviously we know that the uh, headset, you know, the equipment producers and manufacturers need content, they need the material for people to use their equipment, so they have an interest in the development of such projects. And uh, Ocu the, the, you know, Oculus saw the, that uh, Oculus was doing good work and that it would be beneficial to their, their business as well. Now, as to the broadcasting, what we offer is free broadcasting. We are a public TV channel, so we offer alteration, this fiction, for free on our app. There will be a dedicated app, actually, uh, next week for this, uh, this program. It will be for free as well. So all programs are for free. Uh, you've seen just uh, a, a, a few seconds of the so-called Sense teaser. It's a video game. And as with uh, any other video game, it's a so-called freemium model whereby you can play for free uh, the first level or the first chapter, if you will, and then if you want to keep playing, you have to pay. So that's the freemium. So you are out for uh, a wide definition of profitable, not just uh, financial profitability, so sort of social profitability. Well, the way we try to assess our performance is with the audience, you know, the impact that we have, the number of people that we've been able to, to reach. See, there are several ways to count that, I mean, in terms of sheer, you know, views, the number of clicks, if you will, or you know, the discussions that it has triggered, if you will, or 
the visibility that, or the, you know, because obviously we raised the profile of French, French and European creators as well. So there are really several ways that we can measure that. Thank you, Gilles. So Tom, on the BBC side, could you uh, first of all introduce yourself and your position within the BBC? If you want to tell us a little bit more about what the BBC is doing in terms of VR. You may, sorry, you may have to, you'll be hearing me. Okay. Um, I'm Head of Interactive and VR at BBC Studios, um, and uh, I'm, uh, sorry, just get, getting used to having two people talking in my ear at the same time. Mm -hmm. You're quite right, take it out, much mm -hmm. easier. Uh, so Head of Interactive and VR at the BBC Studios, which is the newly formed production arm of the BBC. Before that, and across the majority of the VR work that's currently out there from the BBC, I took a prominent role. Um, so I can kind of talk from both angles, especially around these kind of commercial exploitation side of things and the business models and the way that you approach it, but equally from the point of view of the broadcaster and the commissioner as well, having sat on both sides of the fence. Um, and I guess my background, I've only been at the BBC for three years. Before that, it was a commercial world. So um, I'm kind of, it's interesting to bring that thinking into uh, a public broadcaster and start to look at ways in which we can adapt both without losing the, the kind of the, the things, the DNA of what makes us us. Um, I think at a high level, uh, if I could start from there, the BBC is doing something very similar, I, I suspect, in terms of what Gilles is looking at, which is we're a public broadcaster. We're looking at the way in which we can start to tell stories in new ways to an audience with this medium. We're looking at the types of stories we can tell, um, the types of people we can work with, um, and looking for new talent, etc. And it's very much um, an R&D exercise at this point. Um, you know the kind of questionable audience appetite, the questionable level of distribution, et cetera, et cetera, particularly for a public broadcaster <laughs> who has to very much justify that spend in terms of who it reaches within a UK audience. We've had to tread carefully in, on the one hand, balancing and making sure that we are fulfilling our duty in taking a step into that world and representing the public and representing an alternative to the commercial offering and making sure we're on that curve so that as and when I think we all believe this will start to take off, uh, we can start to push that content out to our audiences and serve them the way we're supposed to. Um, so there's that very fine balance. Um, we've produced a great deal of different types of work exploring different areas, from ones that specialise very much around binaural sound, full CGI and VR pieces, um, equally into 360 video as well. Um, so that's kind of, a, I guess, a potted overview of what's been happening at the BBC. Um, around some of the content we've been producing. I think what I find most interesting at the moment now is, is, is looking at, I guess, to come one rung down from that and to speak very much from, I guess, a more personal and slightly more commercial viewpoint is um, the approach or the maturity of approach we now need to start taking towards the way we look at this because of the pressures that are on this medium or this industry to perform in order to continue to survive. So um, both in terms of the creative approach that you take to the piece um, starting, I mean, I, I in particular, I'm starting to look at, at really, I'm a big believer in the freedom of a tight brief. I think, especially when tackling something new and innovative, aside from all the other concerns, of like being uh, open to multidisciplinary thinking, et cetera, et cetera, it's also about giving yourself a brief that's achievable, uh, understanding what you don't know, and giving yourself the room to understand, to, to, to kind of chip away at that and understand better, more things better. Um, so there's that kind of the way you approach it from a creative point of view. Then there's a pro way of approaching it, which is often feels a bit dirty, I think, especially within creative circles, with how you're approaching it as a business. Um, it's plain and simple. If it doesn't meet an audience need, if it doesn't meet a business objective, if it's not fulfilling one of those things, if you can't map it back to what the business needs in order to continue to survive, then you're probably building the wrong type of thing. So um, at the moment, I'm really interested in looking at formats. Uh, applicable to genres, uh, looking at things that are episodic, so giving the audience actually a chance to build an appetite for this content and to understand it and to build a visual language with them, because after all, as storytellers, if they don't understand what we're telling them or how we're telling them it, we're on a hiding to nowhere. So looking at those formats and models, um, so trying to create content, I guess, that has a better chance and actually pushes things forwards, gives us better chances to learn, gives the audience more opportunities to see things, things where we can create more of them in more different shapes so that the audience can kind of grapple these things and we can get a little bit more reach, keeping things simple and looking at 360 video and the way in which we can get reach from that. And then also looking, I guess, at 
okay, we all know that in an industry that's going as quick as this, you have to keep one foot in the future because that future will be the present in 12 months' time. Um, and those two things converge on a regular basis. So, you know, you need to keep that foot in. But recognizing that actually even there, you can really kind of access, you can really play to the strengths, particularly of a broadcaster, your access, your talent, your IP, the assets you have in a, in a piece of content already to make sure that you're maximizing value straight at the point of commission in terms of the type of project you're creating and giving it the best chance. But then starting to look at what your creative strategy, your, sorry, your content strategy is at point of release. It's all very well doing this thing, but it's not an appointment to view. You need to get it out to people. So starting to think about how the experience will tour, how long will it go on for, who do you want to partner with? At the end of the day, an awful lot of these live experiences, the value they bring back, aside from the audience's experience of them and, and hopefully the positive reception they get, is the brand value that comes back to you, the perception of you and who you are and what you can do and the kind of stories you can tell and the audiences you will reach. So you need to think of them in that slightly, to use a slightly dirty marketing term, experiential marketing. Um, but then looking intelligently the way that you can repurpose, reversion, and rescale these pieces. So CGI I find very interesting. It's full of assets and models which you can continue to reuse. Um, at the same time, you can render out 360 videos of key scenes. So all of a sudden, you're repurposing those assets into a more accessible format, which you can use both to promote, but also to spread the story that you're trying to tell and the experience you're trying to give to an even wider audience, giving it as much reach and potential as you possibly can. Um, so, I mean, that's a really kind of quick potted view. Um, I'm, I only got one video, that's what I'm going to play. I wanted to play one video for you of one of the, mo the most of the ambitious pieces we've done. And then I, I'd like to just map back some of what I've just spoken about to that. So you've kind of got a working example and you can go, okay. <laughs> he didn't just saying it, he did actually try and do this. Um, so, yep. So we have a look at the... Video? So this will be Home VR Spacewalk. <laughs> Donc voilà, donc vous faites une sortie dans l'espace, quelque, quelque chose se passe et vous devez, uti vous devez utiliser votre jetpack pour rentrer chez vous. Donc voilà, c'est assez ambitieux, plus, ça a été plus cher à produire que, euh, bon, que d'autres, voilà, c'était assez ambitieux de ce point de vue-là. Donc il a fallu justement justifier le côté vert de la chose, Tim Peaks, euh, nous avons travaillé avec lui, euh, donc quelqu'un qui euh, fait partie de la NASA et qui s'est entraîné sur ce système, c'est un astronaute, hein. et donc il nous a dit il y a des situations où il faut être assis constamment, il y a des situations où vous évoluez dans un environnement que vous ne connaissez pas, donc euh, c'est vrai qu'on peut essayer de le reproduire. Et euh, en plus ce qui est très bien c'est que comme personne n'est allé dans l'espace, on peut un peu recréer l'espace qu'on veut puisque personne n'y est allé, donc personne n'ira se plaindre. Mais donc il y, y a beaucoup d'éléments qu'il faut prendre en compte. Dans le même temps, on faisait le projet Stargazing, donc on avait d'ores et déjà des contacts avec la NASA, on pouvait vraiment leur parler euh, et on pouvait euh, vérifier les choses factuellement, je dirais. Qui plus est, euh, il y avait un aspect scénario, euh, il fallait écrire, il y avait un, un aspect narration dramaturgie, disons, donc pour encore étoffer euh, un, peu, un peu plus le projet. Il y a également euh, un aspect physique, c'est-à-dire qu'on a les battements de cœur et euh, l'expérience euh, a été créée comme... Euh, 
to as many different festivals, events and arcades as possible. Ayant un intérêt, comme ça, pour autant de festivals, autant d'événements que possible, on voulait qu'il y ait beaucoup d'éléments dans ce, justement dans ce projet. Et nous avons pu euh, réutiliser tous les environnements, euh, puisque c'est un environnement 360, et nous avons enregistré euh, trois astronautes, Ron Garen, bon, je ne me souviens plus de, de leur nom à tous, mais nous les avons enregistrés, ils parlaient de leur expérience dans l'espace, euh, on l'a construit avec un système OpenVR, ça marche avec Oculus, avec Steam, donc effectivement c'est une expérience, ça peut être une expérience fragmentée, mais en l'occurrence si vous travaillez bien sur tous les aspects, vous verrez que vous pouvez le diffuser sur beaucoup de formats différents. Donc, euh, pour moi, c'est ça. Et à mon avis, euh, beaucoup de projets euh, VR n'ont pas besoin d'être aussi ambitieux. Je vois beaucoup de projets qui sont très, très, très ambitieux. Mais en l'occurrence, euh, il faut vous demander, par exemple, si mon programme VR, c'était juste un entretien autour d'une table ou vraiment quelque chose de très, très simple. Euh, quel, quel type de création, d'expression et je pense que, justement, à partir de ces situations très très simples, vous pouvez développer quelque chose de, 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 de très complet. Alors, du coup, on prend un peu la stratégie de so we can see. And uh, so we're coming to cinema now, but uh, are you working in marketing? Are you uh, working with uh, press relationships? Or, uh, I mean, is this the sort of work that's been done so that you can... Uh, no, it's not coming through. Okay, so, so I, I think I got that as, uh, am I working with, who am I working with? Am I also working with in the marketing? Are you investing, are, uh, is the BBC Group investing in uh, marketing uh, to promote those kinds of uh, content? Kind of content. Um, yeah, so it it didn't uh, initially. So you know the BBC is a big beast. It takes a while to get going. It takes a while to get going. It is now getting going. You know this first raft of content that came out was uh, the was the incredible hard work of a number of savvy individuals and great commissioners who had a lot of courage and faith. Um, and I think you know I guess because of the world I came from, that was marketing and promotion was kind of top and foremost, because I realized that that was kind of the way it was going out. So yes, they are now. Um, they're looking at, over the next sort of 12 months, obviously they will be making more things, and they are now starting to take a kind of curated approach to, okay, there will be key ones that we promote and market. So that will be released on Oculus and Steam in the near future. It will be a circus of promotion. I think at the moment what we've had is a real, Again, I don't think uh, quite sensibly, the BBC didn't want to put its head above the parapet until it knew it could do something that felt of the quality that the audience deserved. And now it's done a few things and feels more confident that, yeah, okay, we can do these things and they are of the quality that the audience deserves. Okay, we'll start picking a few key things and we will start putting our, our, our weight behind it. Um, but yeah, hopefully that was And what about the PR services? The PR services, yes. So, I mean, obviously the, the BBC comes with those those services. They're know. working with you on those uh, contents? Um, so, well, yes, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, they, I mean, so that's a, you know, it's a public service commission, so that belongs to them, and they will be promoting it as and when it comes onto the store, and obviously those 360 videos, a purpose-built promotional vehicle as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're slowly starting to understand how you PR around the different types of things you want to get out. The live experience versus three, six, yeah, episodic 360 versus all of these various different uh, bits. I mean, I think the other thing to be key in here is, which is, we're only going to solve, we're only going to work better if we work in a multidisciplinary way. It's incredibly important, I think. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll picking the right partner and working carefully with them. And I think the BBC has always had a very open approach to the way it works with its collaborators and with the agencies outside with these incredible technical skills to build these products. Um, and I, I, I'd like to hold this one up as one of those ones where we work really closely, developed a great relationship, and actually we work together to promote the piece as well, which is, you know, a good thing. Et du côté des artistes, on a beaucoup essayé. Donc, pour Artie, c'est la même situation. Well, for Artie, what we're trying to do is to uh, consider the uh, digital programs in the same way as uh, 
as uh, the other programs, we, we want to justify our, uh, our big communication commitment, what we're proposing uh, in communication on the social networks and so on uh, with the press too. Some of them are events uh, like on TV, uh, some documentaries or fictions or other programs, they're events. And uh, with that we can we can have big press campaigns, we can have uh, big communications campaigns, and we can buy uh, stuff on social media and so on, but uh, and in the press. But uh, one of the aspects that's really very interesting for us is that uh, the relationships that we have with manufacturers of goggles or headsets, people who manage the stores, in fact. So, I mean, if you highlight it on a store, it's really important. For instance, uh, on Steam or whatever, and uh, and uh, it's, it's worth, you know, a lot of uh, big expensive campaigns. So that's important work to do. And particularly because the number, you know, the amount of content is, you know, we haven't got the millions of uh, applications that you can get on the App Store or on Play Store. So featuring on the home page, you know, if it stays longer, it's good, and if it doesn't roll over too uh, much. So right content, right connections, being very visible, I think that are very important. I was talking about press relations as well, we're going to come back on this with Camille, uh, with cinema, or with the experience he told me about. But for people, you know, for this sort of project, you've got to have uh, a very critical part as well. You've got to, uh, you've got to show how these, you know, why these projects are interesting or not. But um, and before we move on to that specific question, maybe you can tell us exactly what you do and uh, the way things work. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, well, you know, Diversion Cinema is a totally private company. Uh, we've got our own equity, and uh, our equity was not very big, but uh, this meant that the project had to work fast. So we started up with uh, a virtual uh, reality uh, uh, project that uh, was called Pick Up uh, VR Cinema back in 2016. And the idea was to say, I mean, I'll go back on, you know, just skim over the history, but we had uh, experiences in virtual reality like uh, a number of us. There was the, the wow effect, and uh, we said, okay, how can we share all of this? And then the idea came along of uh, opening up a cinema, so it meant buying hardware, buying material, so at the time we just had eight uh, seats, and then we had to find, you know, uh, how to get the rights, and then sell tickets, and so on. Why do we call it cinema? Well, because we had to find a way of uh, calling it something, and then we realized that uh, we were provided something that was close to the ritual of the cinema, and uh, then we had to invent everything about the way people bought the ticket, why, you know, when they went into the room, how, what did people do? People, when they saw virtual reality cinema, they didn't know what to expect. There are still people today that come in and they say, well, where's the screen? So it's always a bit fun. So there's, so there's a whole lot of learning to do there, which is very uh, interesting. And to come back to what Jeremy said, we got to a point in the life of virtual reality where, you know, sort of after nine months, and you could say VR and people would come. And because they were curious and virtual reality uh, was a good theme, but a bit like an empty sort of bubble as well in a way. But uh, people didn't know what's going to be happening, but you know, people wanted to go out and see things, and it was sort of a, a key word in a way. And uh, something was very interesting, very exciting, was 
where we realize that we can actually you know produce a content it's not just enough to say well this is vr so that people can get it you've got to give an explanation you've got to give names you've got to give a synopsis you've got to create a desire something just more than virtual reality in itself but having the opportunity of going out and marketing the film the same way as things happen in the cinema you know you say this is cinema people go into the theaters so what's the uh, issue behind it are people going to be coming in and so on now today we've got two VR cinemas in Paris one here in the Forme d'Image the other one that looks off we've got programs they're theme based about 30 minutes long and we invite journalists to come for a screening followed by a discussion with the creator of the program in question and what we realized fairly quickly was this is very difficult today I mean it seems obvious but for the critical area there's very little room it's very difficult to talk about virtual reality people don't have the vocabulary or the means you know it, us journalists I mean you know everybody really in a way once you said wow you know you're there but uh, and this has gone on in between time but uh, it's very difficult to talk about something other than what's been happening in the past it's difficult to look at it's great it's not good I've got a headache I feel sick or whatever and that's a real shame and there's a lot of education to do there yeah it's the beginnings it's the beginnings but it's very interesting to see that we've got to this limit and it's, it's a bit of a problem because it's great to say you know this is VR and everybody can rush in but uh, it's very interesting and very exciting because well, you know, you've got to give more and so the creators have to give more the audience have to give more and uh, things that work but as well and um, uh, today say well what's a good project and what's not so for you is there a business model that can come out of this for you in terms of uh, exhibition you know I'm using the traditional cinema terms you know it's deliberately so for you for the whole of the chain and you've got the role of the distributor for brief pre-funding and so on well that's what we hope now today it's not the case we've got uh, two two activities we've got b2c with cinema and b2b activity so creating virtual reality cinemas for others others who are companies uh, who want this or festivals so b2b is working pretty well and this is what uh, is paying our B2C for the uh, theatres and so this means we've got to put in a lot of energy for searching for content, for films, for the contracts and then physically as well actually going out and looking for the films and so on and as well with the actual installation you know, every weekend in the Luxor you've got to go along and you know actually turn on the projector and everything so even though cinema is working pretty well we've got uh, uh, a rate of about 70 percent uh, filling rate of about 70 percent which is good but uh, but uh, it's not bad but uh, today it's a bit difficult for us even though we're being asked in, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, just have cinema like that because it means you know being out of Paris it means being means moving around it means uh, having people available which isn't necessarily what we're there for we're not a big group but uh, there are other things as well so to conclude what I wanted to say was that the business model needs to be created it exists we're one of the few people in virtual reality today that's a good sign a good sign in the sense there's more and more uh, location based entertainment people LBE and it can be uh, uh, in France and elsewhere and so this is a good sign however 
je crois ouais. que pour nous, l'immersion oui, cinéma, il y en a peut-être qui ont oui, déjà fait. Euh, nous, pour, pour, pour nous, l'immersion cinéma, on est euh, encore dans la recherche du business. Pour nous, in cinéma, we're looking for the e-business model where we can have, you know, we can get a theater at the click of a fingers anywhere in the world. And, uh, il va passer principalement euh, par du logiciel. So we need to go through hardware. software and hardware as well. The actual, uh, the actual device itself. Well, I'm sorry for being very impolite or talking about, cost, about uh, competitors. No, but competitors is good news. So, I mean, you know, you've got the marketing costs and everything that uh, you have to share it all, but uh, in uh, with uh, MK uh, VR, this morning we heard about with Mr. Kamitz, uh, uh, and uh, so you've got the cinemas that are brought in, or uh, where the cinemas can manage their broadcasting, but uh, is this part of the potential strategy? Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, and so the pathway to go towards a, a business model, yeah, well, to be very down to earth, what we're looking at, whether it's here, uh, we've got two two places here, but it means you've got to have the equipment, you've got to have the staff, and it takes time. So the idea, of course, is that for everything to work well, the company to work well, so that we can get earnings in and income, it means the idea of uh, maybe a franchise or something where we're not working directly with our staff is the model perhaps that we should uh, look at. And once again, we're looking at it, we're on it, but we're not there yet. Well, very naively, I thought, uh, you know, you put, the, you put the program in the cloud, you multi-broadcast, and you've got uh, an association and so on, SVOD and, uh, and theater distribution or whatever. But yeah, well, that's uh, today, I mean, it's, uh, it's very interesting because we're creating the model. Now today, this is what we're asked for. And uh, when we signed uh, distribution and exploitation uh, contracts, did you, you know, have uh, exclusivity because it was in digital or whatever? That's not really the problem nowadays. You know, just digital, I mean, in relation to film. But this is, you know, so coming out, the film coming out in theaters digitally, well, that's, uh, that's fine. Because you can imagine RT, for instance, when it's bringing out uh, uh, a film, you know, s you know, they've got uh, they've got a big uh, a lot of clout when they bring out a film, but uh, much more than others. But uh, when they do that, it does help us, and it's not a problem. So somebody comes to see a film, and they uh, they talk about it to their friends, and they'll go and download it from the artist site or whatever. And so. Um, you know, vice versa. So there's all sorts of different permutations possible. So it's very virtuous, it's a virtuous circle. So there are questions of scale economy which are uh, emerging. Again, with the uh, international aspect of the uh, projects. And yes, you've got a very particular position because you're not uh, an exhibitor or a broadcaster. You look at uh, promoting uh, work abroad, particularly for French heritage. Maybe you can tell us about uh, what you've just set up. And, well, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I need the pictures, please. Yeah, the Institut Francais that I represent are, uh, we're, we're, we're here to promote French talent abroad, is French culture, internationally, in the broadest sense of the term. And if we could have the film, it would be great. Okay, so I've got to change the pages, right. So promoting French culture abroad, that's our main mission. And uh, the second point, which is very important, is encouraging collaboration with foreign people. The idea is to get uh, French talent known and help people to develop abroad.
and uh, you know, getting people as well, working in local ecosystems and working with opposite numbers. We work in uh, emerging scenes. We look at uh, culture of artistic creation rather than heritage. And you'll see in virtually all the subjects of creation. But to sum up very briefly what we do, we try to support, circulate, and uh, get people into contact. Now, today, we have a lot of activities in cinema, in, uh, in live performance, in digital, and I'm in charge of the uh, digital development of the Entity Francais. We organize as well. And we have programming of artistic and cultural uh, programs in France, and we export this to abroad. And uh, there was one uh, in Vietnam a few years ago. We've just opened uh, the uh, Colombian uh, program, and uh, this is a bit everywhere, you know, it's all over the place in France. We have uh, artists resident. We send French artists to France and abroad for their research work, the French. Uh, it's a new deal to all of this. So we uh, sort of you know, we, uh, spread the language and the ideas. And that's very important. The Institute deals with the French presence in the major international events, like the Venice Biennale with Xavier Villon, and then in uh, French Alors, representation. Uh, so all over the world, the cultural net, the French cultural network, is around about a hundred institutes, a thousand French uh, alliance française, and then you've got the cultural and uh, uh, the cultural services, the ambassadors of the uh, embassies and uh, consulates. So this means you can have. Uh, Exactly. Very broad projects. Uh, yes, very briefly. There's the case of the US, just to give you an idea of how something like VR can be supported. And uh, in the US, and uh, so you've got the fact of uh, presenting uh, projects of French VR abroad. There's support, financial support, creating links between uh, people, or the organization of events diplomatically and through the organization of uh, support programs. So I'll skim over this, but uh, the work of the Institute and its networks means that uh, a number of French programs are, have been present in uh, major festivals in the US. And uh, you can see the, you can see this. And so just, uh, you know, a plane ticket, you can go from a plane ticket right through to uh, supporting the whole festival. So this can be, uh, you know, research for sponsors or whatever for these events. So then there is the uh, development of a relation between the different professional of this uh, sector. So we help the professional to organize meetings with the professional of the same uh, sector for them to be able to exchange and meet up or to ask uh, uh, organizers of festival to come to France and to allow them to discover the French production. So we provide also support to different festivals in France and also internationally. I will uh, uh, very quickly now. We also uh, help organizing events so with all the uh, diplomatic network, which can uh, uh, set up different pro projects, uh, demonstrations. So here, this is only for United States. The example you have here on the screen, but of course you can uh, imagine that this is something that we can organize everywhere in the world. And then we also we're also involved in the creation of supporting programs. So this is a bit more specific. I'm just going to focus a bit for more on the creative lab, which is uh, uh, inviting startups. So we're going to spend 10 days in New York. And uh, the aim is for them to learn how you can approach the American market. So these are over two weeks uh, uh, 
oriented towards the, the, the practice, the practical uh, workshops on how to pitch in English uh, in order to be able to present to American customers. And the, there are also uh, uh, lessons about the uh, legislation in this country and also how to organize uh, meetings with potential customers. So these are practical oriented uh, uh, sessions and this is in order to foster the international development. So what I wanted to address more specifically today, this is our newborn project, this is culture uh, evr.fr. So this is a website that uh, is already online, but it's still a beta version. And Fabien Sophie, who is here in the room from Media Fabula, was the one in charge of uh, drafting this website. He should not be here, actually. He should be putting content on the website in order to make sure that it's uh, uh, enriched at all times. So the uh, culture VR aims at presenting the best of what exists in uh, VR uh, production in France, so a selection of different programs, portraits of the different players of that uh, sector. And when we talk, uh, when we mention stakeholders, uh, it's not about only the writers, uh, the actors, it's the whole the value sector, chain of the production uh, of this sector. Uh, and with uh, uh, something which is also very important, uh, which uh, is the fact that this is a, a contributive platform. So uh, this will be uh, online with different productions uh, that is going to be enriched over time. But the aim is also to be a, 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 a platform on which we can have a, 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 a tenders or beats uh, on the part of the creators. They can uh, suggest uh, their projects. And we have also a selection of uh, uh, young talents for uh, the school projects, uh, uh, schools in terms of uh, performing arts, digital arts. Uh, we have a lot of uh, VR projects and uh, the schools. Uh, these students are interested in this, are presenting a lot of projects in this area. And we want also to be able to identify the new talents in this area. And this is also one of the aim of this platform. This platform aims at uh, 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 distributing informing or providing uh, disseminating information, but it's also aimed at being a reference basis for all the stakeholders, also the distributors, obviously, because what is at stake here, and it is uh, our ambition regarding that specific project, is that we would like to provide all the information uh, useful for someone who is interested in this topic, in this area, and also to uh, also uh, disseminate internationally the fact that there is an interesting creation and also a whole know-how, a knowledge, a value chain of distribution around this immersion topic. So we aim at bringing together uh, all this type of information, all these stakeholders, and this can be done by a simple thing such as a, a terminology, explaining the difference uh, between uh, uh, specific tools, or I would like to show or display VR, what uh, it's the type of logistic which is needed, what are the uh, technical uh, 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 hurdles that in order to be able to do this. So we would like to provide this type of information. It's a bilingual website, so it's available both in French and English. I would like to be able to have it available in other uh, foreign languages. So you have uh, uh, different uh, uh, portraits, you have different projects. And then I'm going to move swiftly. And this part of this uh, platform has to do with the networks, the development of networks and it aims at also sensing all the different stakeholders uh, of that sector. And there is also the uh, possibility to submit uh, productions, new productions. So uh, you can already have a look. Uh, you can go online and look at this website, even if it's not uh, completed yet. And you cannot yet submit your projects. But Fabien, go back to work right now so that it will be possible very soon. Thank you very much for your attention. So I would like to thank our guests, Tom Burton, Sufresini, Agnès Alfandari. Thank you.